Open the pod bay doors, Tom. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. What would you do with a brain if you had one? Do? Why, if I had a brain, I could... Miles per hour. I could wire away. 46, 56 degrees. Thank you all for coming, and thanks for inviting me. This place is actually very cool. It reminds me of the UC Theater to have in Berkeley before it sadly shut down so many years ago. Um, but anyway, today I'm very happy to come talk to you about our uh, collaboration we've had at Livermore for a very long time, uh, looking at super heavy elements and discovering new elements. And let me just get right to it. Um, here's what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, some of it will be review for you, so just bear with me as I go through it. I'm um, going to talk a little bit about what elements are, and what the periodic table is, and then I'll get into how we made the elements, because the ones I'm going to talk about are all man-made, and how they got named, and then a little bit into what it means for the chemistry of these elements as well. Okay, so what is an element? Probably a lot of you know this already, but just for a quick review, uh, an element basically is what everything in the earth is made out of. So everything you see and you feel and you touch and your cell phone, which normally I whip out at this point, but I realize I don't have it, uh, everything is made out of different elements. And some of these, of course, are very common and you've heard about them. For instance, I'm sure you've all asked for H2O at some point, and that's because water is made up of hydrogen and oxygen, two most commonly found elements in earth, and then the air we breathe has a lot of different elements, actually. We all think of it as um, being hydrogen, but it also has helium and nitrogen and oxygen and argon in it. And then we come down to sand, and sand is mostly made out of silicon and oxygen. And uh, if you're ever wondering why Silicon Valley is called Silicon Valley, it's not because it looks like that, of course, but because silicon is the main element that's used in semiconductors. And we use semiconductors in this project, and pretty much every computer you have has a semiconductor in it too. So silicon is a very important element for modern day electronics. And then there's the most complex mix of elements at all, of all, which is us, people. We have lots of different elements in us. Probably you know mostly that we're carbon and oxygen, but there's also silicon in us as well, and metals like aluminum and iron, and there's calcium in our nails, and our teeth, and our hair, and there's sodium. And as we get older, you have less sodium, hopefully. Um, but let me get on then to how we collect all of these elements. And perhaps you've seen this before. This is the periodic table, which lists all the elements that we know of. And this one actually is complete. And uh, I'll tell Joanna real quick that I realized a couple days ago, last year's version didn't have everything in it because we just had some new names come out a few months ago. So I quickly updated this for you. But this is all 118 elements that we currently know of, uh, including their names. And here are some of the ones I just mentioned on the previous page. Hydrogen is element number one, up here in the left-hand corner. Helium, which I'll be talking about in a bit, is number two, all the way over here. And then there's oxygen and silicon and so forth until we get down here to 118, which is now Oganesson. That'll take a little getting used to for me, I think. Um, so, elements are great, and I'm gonna be talking about this block down here. And it, I'm sorry I'm playing with this so much, I just got this new version of Office, and it has this cool little thingy here, so I'm gonna be using it. Um, but this block down here, starting with NH, which is the homium, element 113, all the way to 118. That's what I'll be talking about later. But before we get into those, let me break down for you a little bit what an element is, because then I can use that to tell you how we make new ones. Okay, so an element is made up of atoms, and probably most of you know what atoms are, or you've heard of atoms. An atom is actually the smallest form of matter that still has the properties of that element. So for instance, if we're talking about helium, in my favorite example here of helium balloons, a helium atom, one helium atom is still considered helium. And then if you have a lot of helium atoms, you can do something like this, where you fill a balloon. In fact, one balloon 
has 10 to the 23rd atoms of helium in it. That's a 10 with 23 zeros. So it takes a lot of atoms to make something that we can hold or see or weigh. Now, if we could look into the helium balloon, what we would see is something like this, if we could get very microscopic. We would see a bunch of helium atoms swirling together. Atoms are not stationary, so we would see them basically jumping all around inside the balloon. And if we could get even smaller and get into what one of these atoms looked like, it would look something like this. Every atom is made up of these different parts. In the middle, we have what's called the nucleus. And yes, this is the nucleus we refer to when we talk about nuclear energy. This is it's the nucleus of the atom. And the nucleus has different particles in it. And there's two flavors, so to speak, of particles. There's protons, which are positively charged, and those are these red dots here. And there's neutrons, which have no charge. They're neutral, therefore they're neutrons. And these particles together make up the nucleus. But also what you need to know is they make up the identity of the atom itself. And that's because it's this number of protons, these red positively charged particles, that determine what atom I have. So for instance, in helium, which is element number two, there's two protons. And any atom that has two protons in it becomes helium. Hydrogen, which is element number one, only has one proton. So any atom with one proton is hydrogen, and so on and so on, until you get really heavy, like 118, which has, yes, 118 protons in the middle. And you can see the scale here that atoms are very small, and they're not something we can typically see, although there are some microscopes they have nowadays that let you uh, get down and look at the atomic scale, but it does not quite this small where you can see the particles themselves. It just looks like a blob. And then surrounding the nucleus, just for completeness, are these negatively charged particles called the electrons. Okay, so here's our helium again. And uh, really quick, I just want to point out, helium's interesting too because it's the first element in this last column, which we call the noble gases. So every element in that column is a gas. And you probably know them, even if you don't know them, because these are the gases they use to make neon signs. They're all called neon signs, but actually they have different gases in them because every one of these, if you charge it, will emit a different color, so purple or pink. So any neon sign you see in quotes has one of these noble gases in it. And our last element, 118, is the last element in this group as well. Okay, so going a little heavier than helium, uh, let's do something that we can actually hold in our hand, like gold big chunk of gold right here. Just because it's gold, it still has atoms in it. And they're all gold atoms. And every gold atom has 79 protons in it. Um, but what the difference is here is unlike helium, which is a gas and you can't smell it or see it or really know it's there unless you, I don't recommend this, unless you suck it in and talk. Yeah. If you've never done it, it's fun once, but I should not recommend that. Um, but I told you that we need something like 10 to the 23rd atoms to get one helium balloon. So if you start thinking about scale, how many atoms does it take to make a big chunk of gold like this? Well, there was a scientist named Amadeo Avogadro, and you've maybe heard of Avogadro's number if you've had high school chemistry already. And this is a number that relates how many atoms you need to make up something with mass namely something you can weigh on a scale. And if we look at gold, and this isn't even our big gold nugget, this little bar here is one gram of gold, which is really tiny, actually. There's a, a little gram bar is very small. You can see the scale here on the corner, on the corner, excuse me. We need three sextillion atoms of gold to make up just that little bar. And now if you think of a big gold nugget that has many grams in it, it's you can't count it. It's just too many, too many atoms. But it's a little bit different when we get to our heavy element case. So here's gold, number 79, right here, what we call the transition metal block. That's all of these yellow elements. And I should point out that on this chart, um, I like this version because all the colors correspond to a different type of chemical property. So everything in the middle here 
is basically, with a few exceptions, a metal. Everything, as I said in this column, is a gas, and so on. So I said we need a lot of atoms to make something like gold that we can hold. But when we get down here to our heavy elements, again, and especially in this section right here, we are talking about single atoms. Namely, we make one atom at a time, and we detect one atom at a time. And we'll never be able to make enough to make a big blob of, say, an element 118 nugget, and I'll tell you why in a bit. Uh, so it's a little bit different case than things that we can dig out of the ground and measure. And that's why it's so challenging. Okay, so let's talk about the periodic table a little bit more, because um, it's actually very interesting. Actually, the ancient Greeks were the first to talk about classifying elements. So we all like to categorize things. If you have comic books at home or, or anything like that, certainly you've probably <coughs> categorized them in some way that makes sense to you. The Greeks were the first to really do that. They were the ones that said, you know, we can look around and see different things, and we can see that there are things that belong to earth, or things that belong to air or water, and earth, water, air, and fire were their four big categories. But it wasn't then until all the way into the 1700s when Antoine Lavoisier really was the first person to categorize all the elements into what we would call sort of the first periodic table, and that's what's shown here. What he did is he took 33 elements that were known in 1789, so not nearly as many, and he started to categorize them based on their properties. Namely, was it a metal? Was it a gas? Was it a non-metal? And remember, at this point, we didn't really know things about atomic structure or molecules or any of this. It was just really observational. It was, how does something react if I heat it or if I cool it? And that's how they uh, categorized these. And then in 1864, so another big period of time passed, an English chemist named John Newland took the 62 elements, and he did something a little different, because at this point they knew how to weigh these elements. So he categorized them based on their mass. And when he did that, something very interesting happened. He started to see repetition. So every time he would categorize things by mass, every eight elements, something would repeat itself. It would be a gas or a metal. And this was the first time that chemists really started to correlate things like the properties you can observe with something like its mass or, um, or whether it was metallic, things like that. And so this was really starting to become what we know as the modern day periodic table. And probably the first really modern periodic table uh, was, was invented by Dmitry Mendeleev, who was actually called the father of modern periodic table. And he categorized elements based on mass, but he took this a step further. He also saw this repetition in things, but instead of just putting them all on a list and saying, well, that's what we have, he realized that there were elements that were missing, and that's what all these yellow blocks are. He said, if things really are repetitious in nature, and they are, nature likes patterns and trends, then chances are there are things that we have not discovered yet that belong in this periodic table. And so he left spaces for things, and it really got scientists thinking for the first time about discovering new elements and creating new elements as well. So now I'm gonna jump ahead a little bit to the late 60s and to Professor Glenn Seaborg from UC Berkeley. And he was the first one, um, actually I'm sorry, this is in the 40s, pre-World War II here either where he started this. Um, he was the first one that took a look at the periodic table at this time. And if you look carefully, now there were a lot more elements that were known. And a lot of those spaces were filled in. There were just a couple missing. It was 43, which is technetium, for instance. And they just would put them in a row like this, filling up this bottom part. But he, when he did that, he noticed something very interesting from a chemical point of view which is that, as I told you, all the elements in this block here behave pretty similarly and that most of them are metals. When he started to put these heavier elements, of, this is now element 90 going up to, at that point they moved up to element 92, 93, the chemistry here did not match what was seen in that metal block. 
And so that gave him a hint that those actually didn't belong there. Because at this point, it was really recognized that, as I said, nature really likes pattern and repetition. And in the periodic table, which is amazing because it's a man-made document, but it's something that nature sort of directed us to do, if you put an element under the metallic elements, it better be a metal. And if it's not, then that really means that's not where it belongs. And so Professor Seaborn was the first one to pull these and put them in this separate series down here. And these are called the lanthanides and the actinides. And in fact, this is what he won a Nobel Prize for. A lot of people think it's for him discovering plutonium, but it's actually this actinide concept that won him a Nobel Prize. Because we look at it now and it seems sort of obvious, but then it was actually very revolutionary that he did that. But because he structured it, what that meant was this last row became empty. So if we jump ahead now, so that now we're in the late 60s, this is where I was going with this. At this point, the, the last naturally occurring element is uranium, number 92. And at this point, nuclear reactors had been discovered and invented. And so Glenn Seaborg and his colleagues at Berkeley were starting to make some man-made elements, but it was sort of crude. They would take uranium and they would put it in a reactor and, and inter let it interact with neutrons, those same neutron particles. And it would start to create heavier elements like Neptunium and Plutonium and so on. And when they got here to the end of the actinide series with element 103, which is Lorentzium, at that point there was a question about what would happen next. Because they filled up the actinides and now they had this whole seventh row that essentially was empty. And the technology at the time, you have to understand, the, the particle accelerator had just been invented. And I'm going to talk about accelerators in a bit. And the accelerators at that time were very small and they were not very powerful. So it really wasn't known at this point where the periodic table would end. There was nuclear theory, which is where you sit there and think about, based on what you know, what could happen next. And theory told people you should be able to make heavier elements. But the technology hadn't quite caught up at that point. So again, sorry, this one's just pointing out again, this uranium is the last naturally occurring element. So all the dirt in the world has some uranium in it. And this is the start of what we call the transactinite series up here, starting with element 104, rather 40. And I already gave you the punchline earlier when I showed you today's periodic table that you know this is now filled in. So I'm going to try and tell you a little bit about how we got there. <coughs> So to talk about making new elements, I have to talk a little bit about some nuclear properties. So there's atomic properties, and that determines the chemistry of an element. Now I gotta talk to you a little bit about the nucleus itself, because that's really what determines what an atom is. So first I'm gonna define for you a term called isotopes. And isotopes are basically when you have the same element, but the number of neutrons differs. So remember I told you that anything that's an atom has the same number of protons. So let's use hydrogen as an example. In every hydrogen atom, there is one lonely proton in the middle. But you can add neutrons into that. You can add more particles. So if we're able to shove in a neutron with the proton, it's still hydrogen, because we still have one proton. But we have an isotope that we refer to as deuterium. It's still hydrogen chemically, but the nucleus has one extra particle in it. And likewise, if we could shove two neutrons in there, we actually make something called tritium, which again is still hydrogen chemically, but it's actually a radioactive isotope of hydrogen that occurs naturally. Um, cosmic rays from space come and interact uh, and create tritium in our natural water supply. So all the water has a little teeny, teeny speck of tritium in it, um, but it's a naturally occurring radioactive isotope. Now, you might think, well, how many particles can we shove into this nucleus? And the answer is only a certain number. The reason why tritium is radioactive compared to just regular hydrogen or regular deuterium is because it actually doesn't want that second neutron in there. See, nuclei like to have a certain number of particles. They really like pairs. They like to have even numbers of things. And if you have an extra particle, it makes the nucleus very unstable. It's what we call energetically unstable, meaning that it, it's got a lot of extra energy that it doesn't want to have. And the only way it can get rid of it is to basically spit out that extra particle. 
So the tritium is radioactive because what it's doing is it's injecting that second neutron from the nucleus because it just doesn't like being there. So radioactivity can take on different forms. In the case of our tritium, which is here on the right, it actually spits out a, an electron, and in so doing, it converts a proton, sorry, a neutron into a proton. So we go from having an unstable tritium to this nucleus, which is an isotope of helium. It has two protons, so that makes it helium. And helium-3 is stable, so it's happy, it stays as helium-3, and it goes about its, its business. When we get to really heavy things, like now up in the actinides, like plutonium, there's so many extra particles that just spitting out one isn't going to do it. So what happens is it actually ejects a whole helium atom from the nucleus, and we call that an alpha particle, and it becomes, in this case, uranium, an isotope of uranium. Now radioactivity actually changes the identity of the atom because we're changing the number of protons. So in this case, when the plutonium spits out its two protons, Natalie has 92 left. That automatically makes it uranium. And same thing over here. When the tritium converts a neutron into a proton, it now has two protons. That makes it helium. And it's interesting because if you have read about any of sort of the, what they called the ancient alchemists, these were people, sort of the first chemists, who were trying to make you know, lead to gold and all of these things. And, and there's a lot of uh, Renaissance paintings of these people. Probably what they were observing was natural radioactivity. They probably had some ores that were changing their properties because when they change elements, they change their chemistry. Hydrogen, for instance, has a different chemistry than helium. So when the tritium decays to helium, its chemistry changes. And the same thing with, it, with the uranium case and so on. So probably what these ancient alchemists were doing was actually observing natural radioactivity and they just didn't know what they were seeing. So they thought they were converting things like lead into gold and all of that stuff. Okay, so one quick thing I need to describe to you is a half-life. Half-life is the amount of time it takes for half of a set of radioactive atoms to decay to something else. So for instance, in my example here, I have these yellow nuclei, and if they're radioactive, after one half-life has passed, I now have half yellow and half purple. And then after another half-life, half of the remaining yellows have gone to purple, and so on and so on, until I have a group that's basically all purple at the end. And half-lives can really vary. So as I said, uranium is naturally occurring. It is radioactive, but it's been on Earth since Earth was formed, so its half-life is literally billions of years. But some things have half-lives less than one second, and that's our problem with heavy elements, we don't have very long to see them after we make them because their half-lives are down to the second or less category. Now some naturally occurring elements are radioactive, as I mentioned, uranium is, for instance. Um, promethium is radioactive, polonium. Um, and these just occur, in, and there's a few others, I didn't circle them all, but they're just part of life, they're just part of nature. And Sometimes at this point, people get a little freaked out and say, oh my gosh, I'm living with radioactivity. And the answer is yes. There's actually a certain amount of radioactivity on the Earth at all times from our natural soil and also from cosmic rays that come from space. And actually, it's okay before you freak out. Our bodies have evolved to be able to handle a small amount of radioactivity. So it's different you know, if you're exposed to a large amount of radiation, for instance. But our bodies are geared to be able to deal with the constant barrage of cosmic rays that are hitting us right now in this theater, for instance, and it's okay. And there's some things that you use every day, in fact, that have radioactivity in them. Here's just a few examples um, before you flip out. Oh my god, I'm never eating bananas again. Bananas do have an isotope of potassium in them, potassium-40, which because of cosmic rays is slightly radioactive. It's not very, but if you had a Geiger counter, and you had a bunch of bananas, it would, it would click a little bit. Not too much, but it would click a little bit. Uh, kitty litter. Kitty litter comes from clays. If it's natural kitty litter that they dug up, clays have a lot of uranium in them. And so, if you, again, you click your cat's litter box, you get a little bit of activity on there, but not much. And smoke detectors are interesting because smoke detectors actually work because of a man-made element, americium. 
So americium is an actinide element, and it's in every smoke detector, and basically what it, what's happening is it undergoes alpha decay, with that thing where I showed you where it spits out a helium nucleus, and if there's smoke, it stops that alpha particle, and that's what sets off the detector. So here's a case where something that's a man-made element is actually very, very useful. And the last example that I, always trips me out a little bit is Brazil nuts. I don't know why, but Brazil nuts of any other food have the most radioactivity per, per uh, serving. Not that you shouldn't eat them, because it's all natural. But there's just a few examples of radioactivity is around us all the time, and it's not anything to worry about. Okay, so let me move on now to finding the heavy elements. We talked a little bit about the periodic table and how it was created and the fact that there's repetition in it, and it determines the properties of things. So I showed you that Glenn Seaborg had this periodic table where he now had the seventh row completely open. And he started to think about the periodic table and, and how far things could go. And he started to think about these half-lives that I just talked to you about, and how the actinides, uranium has a half-life of a billion years, but as he went up in number, suddenly half-lives were starting to get shorter and shorter. They were still pretty long, but they were getting shorter. And so nuclear theorists started to think about the nucleus itself and how many particles can be put into a nucleus before it just refused to be anymore. And that would determine how many elements you could have. So Glenn Seaborg took all of the known isotopes of that time in the late 60s, and he put them on this map of the isotopes, as he called it. And this is a copy of, of that actual picture. And what you're looking at is up on the left-hand side are the number of protons, and on the bottom axis is the number of neutrons. And anytime you see something that looks like a mountain peak, what that means is that the half-lives in that area are very long or stable. And when you get away from these mountains, it means things start to become radioactive until you're out here beyond where isotopes could exist. And if you get into the theory of how a nucleus is put together, and it's changed over the years, our understanding of the nucleus itself, what people learn is that it actually likes to make, kind of think of it as shelving, if you will. It's called the shell model, but you can think of shelves in the nucleus, virtual shelves. And on these shelves are certain numbers of protons and neutrons, just as if you were putting books on a bookcase. And like I said before, there are certain numbers of particles that the nucleus really likes to have. So it really likes nice, even bookshelves with even numbers of things. And there are certain numbers of protons and neutrons that are particularly stable, meaning that it's very hard for these nuclei to undergo radioactivity. And those are the numbers that are here, 28, 50, 82, and then in the neutron side, 126. And if I click here, what this blue X is, is lead. Lead is the last naturally occurring, what we call magic nucleus. Magic because it has both a preferred number of protons and neutrons. And lead has a lot of isotopes because it is so particularly stable. When you get into the actinides, and the, end, the green X is just the end of the actinides, things are still pretty long-lived, but they're getting shorter and shorter because we're moving away from that magic number. You see here we're in this area where we're really between anything where the nucleus is feeling particularly happy. But by the end of the late 60s, people knew about element 104, which is at the end of this actinide series. And if you looked at the theory of what the next magic number would be, everyone predicted it would be here at element 114. But not just element 114, element 114 with 184 neutrons in it as well. This was predicted to be an extremely stable super heavy element. And in fact, it was predicted to be so stable that for a while people thought it might exist in nature. And if you go back to some of the old literature, there are people that were digging around in wars looking for traces of element 114. As I'll tell you in a bit, that now we know would have been impossible because of the half-life of 114. But it got people curious about synthesizing elements now beyond 104 at this point. And so this is how our collaboration uh, and 
by hour, I mean Livermore has been working with the flare-off lab for nuclear reactions, which is in Dubna, Russia, uh, since the late 80s, and which is before my time at the lab, but it's been going on until, it still goes on today, so it's one of the longest collaborations in our laboratory. And this whole collaboration was formed specifically to start looking for these heavy elements. So how would we make a heavy element? Well, I told you earlier we need a certain number of protons. So let's say I wanted to make an element 116, which is Livermoria. To do that, I would need 116 protons, but how do I get there? So let's go and take calcium. Calcium has 20 protons. It's also a stable, sorry, magic nucleus, because 20 is a magic number. So it's a particularly stable element as well. So let's say I take calcium, and if I take curium, curium is a man-made element, it has 96 protons, but if I could take an element, sorry, an atom of calcium and an atom of curium, and if I could make them fuse together completely so that all their particles were together, I would indeed have 116 protons, which would be one atom of Livermoria for however briefly it stuck around. Sounds easy, right? But here's the problem. If you've ever played with magnets that have plus and minus poles on them, you probably remember that you take your two magnets with the pluses, and if you try to put them together, they just don't want to go, right? Because plus charges repel one another. You've got to turn one of those around, and then they'll stick. Same thing with charges in the nucleus. Protons are positively charged. They do not want to come together. The only reason why nuclei exist in nature, and this is one of these really fascinating things that will blow your mind thinking about how nature came up with this, the only thing that keeps us around because it keeps our atoms around are the neutrons. Neutrons are like a glue. They basically buffer those protons from one another so that they don't just repel apart. That's why we need a certain number of neutrons to keep things stable. But as we get heavier and heavier, even the neutrons can't keep up is the problem. There's just too many protons that are trying to shove together. So how do we make a new element? We have to encourage it strongly using a gigantic particle accelerator, basically. This one in particular. This is the U400 cyclotron, which sits at the flare-off lab in Dubna. And for scale, I'm just going to put these up here. For scale, here are some stage scientists looking very important in this picture. Um, but you can see how gigantic this whole instrument is. And it needs a large room to be in because it has huge magnets inside. And it also has a lot of concrete shielding around it because it does emit radiation as it's undergoing particle acceleration. So what happens in an accelerator is we start with an ion of interest. And this, let's use our Livermorian example. So let's say we have calcium. And we want to slam the calcium into a curium. We take a source of calcium and we put it into a source that heats it up and turns it into ions. We then have these two very large magnets, which look like the letter D, in fact they're called D magnets. And we alternate a charge across those magnets so that our calcium ion, which itself is positively charged, gets attracted and repelled away from the magnets and it starts to spin around and around faster and faster and the magnetic field keeps it going in a circular pattern. And we keep doing this until the energy of that ion is a fraction of the speed of light. And then we let it come out and we let it slam into our target of curium right here at the end. And then what happens is we have to collect it and detect it. Again, easy peasy right uh, real quick, I just want to show this picture because this is the actual curium target that was used for the discovery of Livermorium, so I like to show this one. Um, I also like to put it up because uh, curium itself is a very interesting element. Uh, it was named after Marie Curie, who probably a lot of you have heard of, um, but I just think she's very fascinating. She was the first woman to win the Nobel Prize and the first scientist to win two Nobel Prizes in two different areas. She won one in physics for actually her studies of radioactive decay, and then she won one in chemistry for discovering elements of polonium and radium. And the first Nobel Prize she got, she was not allowed to attend the ceremony because no woman had ever gone into the Nobel ceremony before. So thankfully, things have come a long way since then. 
But she also did some, what I even, that's really interesting to me as a nuclear chemist, but the part that I like reading about is she developed the first mobile x-ray units. So in World War I, she figured out that x-rays could be used to look for shrapnel in soldiers that were injured. And she was the first one that took this into the field and really saved a lot of soldiers who had shrapnel injuries. So that's, um, her life is very fascinating. I always throw that out there because if you are told you need to do a biography and you're stretched for, oh, who am I going to do this year? I rec she has a very fascinating life. I can recommend that one. For sure. Okay, so let's get back to our, our heavy elements. So we've taken our calcium and we've accelerated it in our giant cyclotron and we got it up to really high velocity and now we're going to let it slam into our target of curium. And what happens, like billiard balls, if something's still and this thing slams into it, it gets kicked out the other side. So our new element now gets spit out the back. But unfortunately that's not the only thing that gets spit out a lot of beam particles that don't react, there's part of the target might come out without reacting, or things that are not the heavy element. So we use this device, which is called a gas field separator, and what this does is it has a series of magnets in it, and those magnets are used to basically deflect away anything we don't want and just let our heavy element go right through. It's not 100%, unfortunately, but it certainly improves how many uh, atoms we get in our detector, which sits back here. The detector is a shoebox, essentially, open from the front, and it's made out of silicon semiconductor strips. And the reason why we use those is because when our heavy element slams into this detector, it undergoes radioactive decay. And that decay emits a signal that we can record electronically. And so we use the semiconductor strips to tell us if we had something fly through our separator and hit our detector. And then we can watch it, virtual watch it, decay in the, in the uh, detector strip. And what we do is we record every time we see one of these decays, where it was in this box and what time. And we can correlate all these decays to something. And that's how we determine if we detected a heavy element. So I really like to show this periodic table, but this one now is not up to date either, so I gotta get, get those guys to fix this one too. Um, I like this one because it gives you an example for every natural element of, an, of a physical thing that is made out of the element that it's depicting. And when you get down here to these man-made ones, these man-made elements are all named after people or places for the most part, because again, it's not something we can show you an example of. Uh, we can show you things like plutonium because there's enough of it that you can hold it or see it. But when we get to our heavy elements here, we don't have enough to make a thing before it decays, so we can't give you an example. So when I get up here to these elements that we're talking about today, how do we even know we have one? Because I can't weigh it, I can't see it, I can't smell it. And I told you that we use that detector and so, what does it look like in air quotes? It looks like this, which is a series of numbers that a supercomputer spits out for us. So every time something hits that detector and gives us a signal, we get one of these rows of numbers. Very interesting, isn't it? But we can do something with these numbers that is interesting. We can go through and sort it. We can look for trends in radioactive decay, lifetime, where in this detector they were because it's got to be in the same place. And if everything lines up just so, then we know that's the signature of a heavy element. Now what you're looking at here is the actual discovery, if you will, of element 117. This is the event that became element 117 in the blue shaded boxes. And luckily at Livermore we have uh, some of the world's largest supercomputers so we can go through this data very quickly. Because let me tell you, these experiments are not short. They take a very long time to make heavy elements. In fact, most of our experiments go anywhere from three to 12 months to get zero to three atoms out. These are very high patience, high payoff experiments. And here's the reason why. We have a very low probability of success, unfortunately. And it's because these protons, as I described, do not want to come together. There's just too many of them. So even though we've accelerated our calcium and it's going super fast, it's really hard to get it to fuse completely with the target atom. 
they just don't want to do it. Most of the time they'll just fly apart or they'll kind of fission themselves into two other things and they'll, and they'll come apart very quickly. If we start with 10 to the 18 calcium, so 10 to the 18 zeros after it, number of calcium coming into our cyclotron, the statistics say we'll get one to three heavy elements out the back end. All the rest of the almost 10 to the 18 calciums are gonna result in nothing. So these experiments are very, I will say, time intensive, and you really have to be very patient <laughs> to get any payoff at all. Okay, real quick, I'm gonna show this video, and I'm gonna, because the video is only a couple minutes, but it demonstrates kind of everything I just verbally told you about how an element is made. And yes, it's animated, and so it's not, it's not quite as clean as this video shows, but it actually helps me figure out what's, uh, what's going on. So what you're looking at here, and this is for element 117, but it can be for any of these cases, it's just that here we have a target made out of a man-made element called berkelium, which is named after berkelium. So we have our target of berkelium atoms, and the target is spun, and that's because when these calciums come and hit it, it heats it up, and so in order to prevent our target from falling apart during the experiment, we spin it very fast so that the beam is always hitting something moving. So this is supposed to depict our calcium atoms coming down after they've been accelerated through our cyclotron, and now they're gonna come and hit our target. And most of the time, you see nothing happens. They might hit it briefly, they might break apart. Uh, so what we're really looking for is that one in 10 to the 18 statistics where here comes our, our favorite calcium who happens for a moment to fuse with one of these berkelium atoms. And for that brief moment, it has 117 protons, so it is an element 117 for as long as it lasts. Even though these things have short half-lives, as long as it has a number of protons for a moment that we can detect, it is an element uh, of that number. So it goes through the particle separator, which is not quite as clean as this by any stretch, but this shows it a little better. And now it's on our detector, and we just watch it virtually go through this alpha decay. And every time it alpha decays, it becomes another element and we see that electrical signal until the end of just fissions and it goes away forever. So how long does this take? Well, the half-life of these things in the super heavy elements range from hours to milliseconds. That's a thousand of a second. So these things are very fast, very fast. And so we have to create it, we have to separate it and detect it before it goes away. So. It's a very short process that they go through. And there's not many places in the world where this can be done because you have to have this giant particle accelerator and you have to have the right material to make a target with. Uh, so Berkeley was really the first place that started doing this. Um, back when Glenn Seaboard was there, and they even continued to this day doing heavy element experiments at their cyclotron. Here's the, uh, the blue X in the upper right is the lab in Dubna where we do our experiments. And then there's a lab in Germany and a lab in Japan where these are done. And all of these labs also have elements that they have named because they've discovered, because they've discovered them. So how do we name an element? Well, we do this experiment that goes on for many, many months. And if we're really lucky, we get a couple of heavy element atoms out of it. And we do what scientists always do, we write a paper. <laughs> write a scientific journal paper that describes what we did in our experiment. And it goes out there and gets reviewed, and then nothing happens for a long, long time. And that's because for anything to happen, meaning how do we get this element we discovered on the periodic table, someone has to confirm it by running the same experiment independently at a different lab. So now another one of these labs on the map has to decide they're gonna give up nine months of their time to validate something that somebody else did. But luckily this is a pretty tight-knit group of scientists and they do do that for each other. There's a lot of cooperation in heavy elements because it is a small community 
And so oftentimes these places will basically stop what they're doing to confirm an element. But sometimes confirmation literally takes decades. You might have a discovery that's reported you know, back in the 80s or 90s, and maybe it got named a year or two ago. Sometimes it takes a very long time. The group that's in charge of naming elements is called the International Union for Pure and Applied Chemistry, or IUPAC. They're actually in charge of naming everything chemical, molecules, uh, chemical compounds. They're, they're all part of that. So when I showed this last year, only two of these boxes had letters in them because the rest were actually, and the two that were there were element 114, which is fluorobium, and element 116, which is the memoriam. And we were given permission to name these just a couple years ago because finally another laboratory, um, actually LVL in Berkeley and the GSI in Germany both did part of the confirmation. They finally confirmed this, so we were given permission to name these two. And we and our collaborators decided to name them after our respective institutions, the Flare-Off Laboratory and more some more National Lab. And then the other day, as I said earlier, I panicked because when I looked at this slide, I said, but wait, a few months ago, they actually named the last four elements that were missing names, so I had to go in and fix it up. So here's what we have. 113 is interesting because there were actually conflicting claims. So the Livermore and Dubna collaboration reported discovery of 113 at the same time that the group in Japan reported discovery of 113. So IUPAC put together a group to decide who was going to get to name it. And they decided that the Japanese should get credit, so they named it Nihonium, which is NH, and here's our fluorobium. And then element 115 and 117 were discovered by the Livermore uh, Dubna collaboration, but this time Oak Ridge National Lab, which is in Tennessee, supply the material, so they were part of our collaboration. So 115 is named Moscovium, because the Moscow region is where the flare-off lab is, and 117 is named Tennessee. I'm sorry, it's not my favorite name, but it'll, I'll get there eventually. It doesn't roll, <laughs> it doesn't roll very well. Um, and it's Tennessee because all the elements in that family have ene at the end, like astatine is in that group, for instance. And then 118 is Oganesson, and that's named after Yuri Oganesson. He's been the leader of the flare-off heavy element program for decades. And so this was a way to honor him, um, as he's probably going to have to retire very soon. He's way past retirement age, but he just loves it, so he won't, he won't stop. And this is Oganesson because this is now in the noble gas column, including things like xenon and radon, so the naming conventions are, are there. So now we have this complete, finally, 118 names on the periodic table and everything's done. So what does this do for us? Well, I'm a chemist by training, and so I always think about the chemistry of things. And I told you earlier that the periodic table, and I'm pointing at nothing, I realize, because I turned off my pointer here. Um, the periodic table, I told you, determines the chemical properties. So for instance, these are all of our metals, and these are our gases, these are the alkali metals, which make a lot of salt. And so if we get down to the heavy elements here, we're only making one atom at a time. So for me, like the projects that I work on most of the time related to this stuff have to do with how do we correlate the chemistry of one atom to the chemistry of its group in the periodic table. So in terms of where we're at with chemistry, we pretty much know the chemistry of all the naturally occurring elements. We know how these things behave, of course, because we can get them abundance. When we get to the transactinides, we pretty much have a handle so far on 104 to 108. And that's because even though they're man-made and they're radioactive, their half-lives can be as long as hours. So they actually can make enough to do chemistry on and they can compare to the elements above them in the periodic table. And for the most part, they behave like you'd expect based on where they sit. Um, so 104 behaves like you'd expect from this group, and so on and so on. But when we get out here, it's completely unknown what's going on. And that's because these half-lives are getting very short. So doing chemistry here is getting extremely difficult. Uh, what we're really interested in right now is element 114, fluorobium, which is right here. So if we go back a while when I talked about nuclear structure and how certain nuclei like to have different numbers of protons and neutrons. 
And 114 was predicted to be our next quote-unquote magic nucleus, meaning that it would be really stable and long-lived. Well, we're not there yet because we also need neutrons, and we don't have nearly enough neutrons in the system. If we had 184 neutrons, we can say yes or no, it's the next magic element, but we're not anywhere close to 184 neutrons. So we still don't know if it's the next magic element, is the punchline. But because 114 is a special number of protons, it actually changes, this is theory, theoretically, it changes the chemistry of the atom itself, meaning that the nucleus is so large and has so many protons that it's actually changing how the electrons orbit. And it's something we call relativistic effects. And it actually, yes, has to do with relativity from Einstein's theory of relativity. It says that the electrons are moving so fast that their mass and their orbits are changing. And chemistry is determined by the, how the electrons interact with each other. So we're changing chemistry. So there are a lot of predictions for fluorobium. Some of them say it's going to be very regular. It sits below lead. It's going to be like lead. We're done. But there's other predictions that say it might be a gas. In fact, there are some predictions that say it could be like a noble gas, which now should blow your mind because I told you all the noble gases are over here. So if fluorobium ends up being a noble gas, what does that mean for our periodic structure? Well, right now it means nothing, so you don't have to not memorize your periodic table. But it's something that right now scientists in the heavy element chemistry area around the world are really looking at fluorobium because if they can determine its chemistry, it'll determine where the periodic table is possibly breaking down in these super heavy elements. So the picture in the middle proves I did used to go in labs. I'm a group leader now, so I don't go in labs very much anymore, but I did, I did actually do it. Uh, so how do we do chemistry on a single atom? Well, it's just as challenging as making it, because the first thing you have to do is make it. So we still need our cyclotron, we're still accelerating our, our calcium, and we're still making our one atom. And now instead of letting it go to a detector, what we have to do is get it into some chemical system. And what can that be? It can be a gas, it can be a liquid, it can be a certain molecule. And we do this so that we can try to correlate its chemistry with things that we already know how to behave. So for instance, 114 sits below lead. If we study lead in a certain environment, and then we study 114 in that same environment, if they behave the same, then we can say, we're like lead and we're good. But if it's completely different, then we have to start rethinking how the chemistry is. But we have half-life problems. So the detection of these things is very fast, I told you. The process is extremely fast, separation and detection. The chemistry is not very fast. And usually you want things to equilibrate. In this case, we can't have equilibration because the longest lived isotope of fluorobium is two seconds. That means after we make it, we have two seconds to do chemistry with it and get it to somewhere we can detect it. So it's not very long. So what are we working on? We're working on automation. Chemistry that can be done every few seconds over and over again for nine months at a time. The Japanese, are a little more ahead of us in this game because they are building robots to do it. And it's probably in the end going to be some mixture of some brute force automation and some robots that will have to do this over and over again. Because we're literally doing chemistry on a single atom. And a postdoc working with us at Livermore, what he's thinking about is using some very unique molecules that are equal in size to a 114. Because let's say we can make a 114 and get it stuck in the middle of one of these ring molecules, that would tell us instantly about the chemistry because we know how big these molecules are. It would tell us the size of the, the 114 atom. So this is real-time research going on at Livermore. We're looking at some of these molecules right now and which ones would effectively take 114 and do chemistry on it. So in addition to the chemistry we're working on, what's, what's the future? How do we go higher than 118? There's got to be another row, right? Because we ended row seven, that makes now a new row that we can start. Well, it's getting harder and harder, to be honest with you, because the half-lives are getting shorter. 118 has a half-life of less than one millisecond, so we're talking really short. The probability of making these things is even smaller, and that's because as we go bigger and bigger, we're trying to shove more protons in the system. It's resisting even more. 
And then materials are not always available. So these targets we use are man-made elements in and of themselves. And as we get heavier and heavier in the targets and actinides, we sometimes just don't have enough to make a target. The next place to go when we use a target of an element called Einsteinium, O99. There's just not enough Einsteinium around to make a big enough target for these. So we're getting kind of stuck. So does that mean we're done? The answer is, right now, I honestly don't know. This is where technology shifts have to come about. Just like from when Glenn Seaboard started doing his research with reactors, then we moved into particle accelerators. Uh, Ernest Lawrence discovered the cyclotron, he invented the first cyclotron at Berkeley, and it was four inches. It's actually up at the Lawrence Hall of Science if you ever get up there. The cyclotron we use in Russia <coughs> is much larger than that, as you saw. And the world's largest cyclotron, which is at Triumph in British Columbia, is even bigger. It's like taking several of the cyclotrons in Russia and putting them together. But every one of these things took a technology jump, and that's where we're at now. We, the Russians are building a new accelerator that should be ready in a year or two. It's supposed to have something like 100 times more intensity in its beam. So 100 times more particles coming out per unit time. But the target won't be able to take that, so we're also doing new target development. What kind of materials can we use for a target that will withstand that kind of intense bombardment for 12 months? And then the electronics have to be faster. The electronics have moved over the past several years from analog to digital, so how do we get things to record even faster? So all of these things are being developed right now. So it may, maybe in a year or two there's an element Y19, it may be a decade. I honestly don't know right now, but there's got to be some technology changes that happen first. Uh, so I think I just went over all this. So this is uh, what's happening in the heavy element community. We're doing, uh, there's the production side and the discovery side, which is mainly focused right now on the technology, on the cyclotrons and the targetry. And then there's the chemistry side, where we're looking at new ways to think about chemistry and how to do them, including these new molecules and maybe chemistry on the chip, uh, things like that. Did the chemistry on a chip people come and do one of these talks here? So same kind of concept, just you know, can we use that small scale to look at a single atom on the chemistry? And um, here's, here's the funny thing real quick. So I won't give you spoilers of the movie, although probably you've all seen way more superhero movies than I ever have. Um, but here's Tony Stark in his garage <laughs> building his particle accelerator, as you'll see. And it looks a little different than what I showed you. Um, first of all, it's not nearly as big, and it's not shielded. Um, but he's Tony Stark, so you know, he, doesn't, he doesn't care. Um, and he's also using light beams, as you see in this picture, uh, to do his new element gig. And so now that I've told you about how elements are made in quote unquote real life, when you watch the movie, it'll be very interesting. Think about when Tony Stark does it. Some things he does are very accurate, and some things are not, and that's okay, because we know that movies are not always scientifically accurate, they're supposed to be fun. But now that you know how we really do it, you can, you can think about it later tonight. What would Tony Stark really would have had to do to make a new element? Could he really just throw this together in his little lab and, you know, told Jarvis to go make a new element and it happens? That would be great. Um, really what it takes is a huge team of people. These are all the people that work on these experiments. Enormous groups of people. Because we need chemists, we need engineers, we need accelerator experts, we need material scientists, we need physicists, computer scientists, etc., etc., etc. This group represents all of these areas of science. Um, and there's all, not only here's our director at Livermore, and this probably isn't everybody, even that's been in the building, there's enormous people. Here's Oak Ridge, the lab in Tennessee, and we work with universities as well. So. These are large numbers of people working together collaboratively to do these experiments. And I think that is my last slide. So thank you all so much for your attention. You've been great. Thank you. Are there any questions? I think I can take a few time lines.
That is, yes. The question was, if we could get 184 neutrons into a 114, would it be stable? And the answer is, that is the prediction, is because now we would have both what we call magic protons and magic neutrons, and we're not sure exactly how long-lived it could be, but some predictions say it could be years. So we could actually then think about stockpiling a few and doing some chemistry on them if we got up that high. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, one more time. Uh, what, uh, where we make what at that? I'm sorry, I'm having trouble hearing you. Here we go. Oh, what if we didn't have matter? Oh my goodness, none of us would be here. <laughs> we are all matter. Everything here is matter. So, other questions? <laughs> oh dear, biology. I know. I know very little. <laughs> Oh yes, everything is made of atoms. Um, everything, even animals, trees, everything. So since people are, um, are, are anxious to get to the next level of our presentation, I'd like to thank Dr. Shaughnessy for time.